I get a lot of so much slack. I'm like, it's not, it wasn't my choice when they're like, you know, she's like, I could do this all day. And then followed by, she's immediately cut in half by a Frisbee. And, <laughs> and then the audience being like, she can't do it all day. Uh, apparently, apparently not. Apparently you can't. So yeah, egg on your face. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't really serve Peggy very well. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, sad, confused begins now. Today on Happy, Sad, Confused, I'm Josh Horowitz, and my guest today loves barreling through the streets of Rome, handcuffed to Tom Cruise, uh, dancing into the sunset with Steve Rogers. Mm -hmm. She's at home on the stage. She's also at home talking to me. She's a very wise lady. It's the one and only Haley Atwell. Wow, what an introduction, Josh. Thank you. It's it, good to see you it's again. It's so good to see you. Um, I've, I've been on the periphery a little bit on this mad tour of yours. Yeah, you were there at the beginning in Rome. I was there at the crazy yeah. world premiere, Spanish Steps, as one does. The first time it's ever had a premiere, the Spanish Steps. I mean, if anyone's going to be able to get a premiere there, it's Tom. So it was a Surreal. lifetime experience. Insanity. How are you holding up? I was just saying, when you walk in the room, you seem remarkably composed and coherent for somebody that's been traveling the world for a few weeks. I am. I think there's different stages of delirium that kicks in at different times of the day. But I think also when you've, we've come towards the end of it now, and the response of the movie, if people have seen it, is so overwhelmingly positive that it gives me so much energy yeah. you know so the 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 interviews I've done the people I've met they've loved it and it feels like this film was always designed for an audience on the big screen so to have it delivered in their hands now is like I feel like my job's done I can just enjoy it uh, this kind of movie does make my job easy it's a uh, mission impossible dead reckoning part one it's a mouthful but it's worth it um, and it's extraordinary it is exactly what you want out of a ginormous summer blockbuster and it's so satisfying and I have to say, um, like, I don't know, my experience watching the movie was one of just exhilaration and also relief. Like, it's like, how, how does McHugh and Tom and you guys keep uh, upping the ante? What was it like for you watching the finished product of this for the first time? It was, it was having been there on set every day and been working on it for four years and then sat there in the audience. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time, even though I know what happens. And I think it's a credit to also Eddie Hamilton, the editor, who just knew how to always create that sense of pace and momentum and excitement. And I remember when I was asking Tom, you know, what's the running time of this? Like, it's a long movie. And Tom's response was so good. He just said, it's as long as it is entertaining. Right. And it's true. So for me, when I watched it, it goes by so quickly because you're, con you're just, they know how to keep you engaged. Um, so I was, you know, it was, it was bittersweet. You know, my mum was sitting beside me when I saw it for the first time and seeing it kind of vicariously through her eyes. And she kind of looked at one point during the train set sequence and she was like, I didn't, how did you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know I either. No, I have no idea. <laughs> Talk to McHugh. I don't know how they did it. Yeah. Speaking of parents, I, we should just acknowledge <laughs> Dad is like My five feet dad away, is right off here. camera. Yeah, it's very sweet. And this must—it must be fun to just sort of experience this kind of thing through friends and family because it yeah. does give you a bit of perspective on the madness. Yeah, <laughs> and they know how hard I've worked and how far I've come in seventeen years of working in this industry. They've supported me, been through everything with me, and always retained that sense of kind of loyalty and kindness and support. And so now, also, it feels like a something I can give back to them of like a great night out of the cinema. You yeah. know, it's a it's a family affair. So you were last on the podcast five years ago yeah. for Howard's End. A study in contrasts is Haley Atwell. <laughs> this, this is the proof of range as an actor. Um, give me a sense. I mean, when this comes around, um, this opportunity, were you, I don't know, like how calculated are you about kind of crafting a career? Like, are you thinking like, you know, I've done the Marvel thing, but it's good to have kind of a franchise. <laughs> like, do you think in those terms or is that like, is that the death of art, of creativity for an artist? It's a good question. And it's a, it's such a hard one to reckon with because there's so much that's not in your control as an actor. And you've got this creative life, but it's married to a business, which is full of, you know, rejection, full of like, you, you know, networking and meeting filmmakers. And then sometimes you might have a connection with them, but the timing doesn't work out. There's so many factors in it that you can't really, you can't make, you can't plan. You know, when I first came out of drama school, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to work. Right. 
and I wanted to develop enough of a skill set and a craft that I felt like I had something to offer. And the classical training kind of set me up for lots of different genres. And I, so I didn't have in mind, like, it's just, it's going to be this or it's going to be that. Because, I mean, as soon as I tried to make any sort of direction, it, I would get laughed at by the jobs that would come my way or wouldn't come my way. And I think the work ethic has remained the same for me. Yeah. So I could do Howard's End and then I could do an Ibsen play and then I could do a Mission Impossible franchise. Because really it's about just scene playing with different people yep. and hoping that you can bring some grounded, psychologically astute kind of take on a character regardless of the genre that it fits into. And you would, I would think also like now in hindsight, getting this role when you did, you've accumulated these kind of different skill sets that you can kind of all bring to bear on a role like this, <laughs> in, a, in a film like this, where it requires the physicality, it requires the nimbleness, it requires everything you've kind of accumulated as an actor. Totally, totally. And, and that was part of the, the screen test with Tom and McHugh. They were like, we, we don't have a character. We, ha we, we find the actor we want to work with, then we create the character with them. So they created this environment where I could just come up with lots of different readings and different choices. And <laughs> they were saying sort of in the edit, they were like, you gave us so much range. We, we could di dial you up or dial you down. And I was like, yeah, because I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> So Okay, we need to dig into this more because I've had this conversation with you and all the actors in the Mission films and it's like, it, it still boggles my mind these movies are as amazing as they are because they shouldn't be. <laughs> they shouldn't be. Yes. It is, and, and, and I've heard you talk about this. We've talked about this before. You being such a slave to writers, to like the written word. There was no finished script that you ever, <laughs> like you had in the beginning. I mean, it's okay to talk about it because the movie's great and they, they know how to do it. It's like, yeah. there's something to apologize for. Yeah. But... For you, this must have been like so counter to everything that you are brought up on. You're out of control, which I, and someone that's usually tries to take control of the things that are within my orbit and then let go of what's not in my control. I had none in this. So what, but I, what I did have was trust. And I trusted McHugh and Tom every step of the way. And I trusted Wade Eastwood and Sam Eastwood who trained me throughout this. And because I knew that they were so hardworking and they have this way of going, it's not like we want to shoot a script. We want to shoot a movie. And we might have an idea of what the movie is going to be in our heads. Right. But on the day, the camera or the frame picks up something else. And then we just go with that. So they're always reevaluating what they've done and what they're doing. And McHugh says, there are three kind of, there are th you make, there are three movies. Right. The first movie is a movie you think you want to make. Then the, and that's all pre-production. Then there is the movie you're actually making which is in production. And then in the edit, you discover the film you've actually made. Right. <laughs> and they can be very different. And so, you know, as, a, as an actor, if you feel like you're in the company of people that you can really give over that to, then it's quite exciting. And it gives you an opportunity to try lots of different things, knowing you can't get it wrong because there's not gonna be in, the bad stuff isn't gonna end up on screen anyway. So right. you're kind of free, you're safe. So how much of a different grace exists in <laughs> the digital cameras the, the, uh, that exist, the archives of footage? Like, what, when we're talking variations on grace, how different was she and, and what did you give them? There, was, there were moments where she was, um, we had this beautiful like, nod to the sting. Mm -hmm. And um, Tom and I would, every so often, we'd do this to each other. Sure. And... That we did it quite a lot. We did it in the airport where she takes that she she you know stitches him up, and then we do it also when she gets out of the Fiat Five Hundred when she's kind of ditched him, and then we also do it when she's called him a pervert publicly, and <laughs> right. she kind of gets away in an elevator, and we do this, and then and we love we like oh how lovely how charming what yeah. a great nod to, though you know that those seventies heist movies, but how it ended up reading is that she seemed to be more calculating, and right. she seemed to actually relish and making life hard for Ethan. And it meant when they were watching, because we don't like her because of that. And so they were always trying to work out, we wanted to be clever, we wanted to be you know, nimble, like you said, we want to have a physical relationship that felt like a dance with Ethan when they're handcuffed to each other. But we always want to, we want to be on her side, or we right. want to at least go, we kind of understand or forgive her for the things that she does, because right. she's, she's actually more in a state of hypervigilance. And she doesn't know this guy. She doesn't know the world that she's in. So she's in survival mode the whole time. So we understand why she does the things that she does. And there was, there was an, also another one where I betrayed the, the team another time. And 
I, we, it was a great scene. It was so well done. It was beautifully shot. And it was like, oh, it was like a kind of a twist moment. And they looked at it afterwards and just went, she, she, we've, she's just betraying people to one too many times right. for the audience to actually forgive her or to not make it look like the IMF are stupid. Like, you, they would right. know by now. Right, right, right. So, They're pretty good at what they do. Yeah, yeah, it was things like that. No, it's interesting because it occurred to me uh, in watching it too, in the hands of a lot of actors, because uh, this is a tough role because the, th the actions that Grace does, you're, you're kind of screwing things up yeah. a lot. She for... changes the plot. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, if you're not an innately also likable performer, I would say, you need somebody that can that can just bring a natural likability, if you can accept that as a compliment, and I mean it as such, um, even in the face of doing things that maybe the audience is questioning and saying, wait, you're, you're screwing things up for our heroes. Absolutely. And also, you know, there was, like, some sort of, I mean, there was the certain comments of going, well, where's Ilsa? Right. And, like, what, oh, she's coming to, you know, to take over, and it was so not the case, and... Rebecca Ferguson is so distinctive and powerful as Ilsa in this franchise. And it was going, this is not about, you know, I think it also kind of, it's not about pitting characters against each other. Yeah. And me coming in as a newbie doesn't mean that I'm usurping anything or taking over anything. It means it's a new, fresh perspective. So yes. how could I You're the first, like, civilian in a mission movie, essentially. Yes, exactly. And wanting to feel like, okay, the audience have got to, uh, that she's got to kind of earn that from them. But there were also times I remember doing takes where she was so, um, she was more charming and she was more vulnerable. And it was a bit like how it then ended up reading within the structure of the film. It was like she was trying to win the audience over. Right. And McHugh and Tom were like, we like her less when she's trying to be nice. First of all, we don't trust her. <laughs> right. But also it feels, uh, it, the audience go, they, they pull back from her a little bit. Yeah. But if she is unapologetic in her own drive and intention to just survive, and she's not trying to win everyone over. In fact, she's trying to, it's, Hayley Atwell is trying to get out of a Mission Impossible franchise, essentially, <laughs> is what the kind of the character read could be. Right. That then we kind of like her more, because yeah. she's, she's not manipulative. I think it's interesting, you, you mentioned, and I, and I saw this reaction, and it sounds, it sounds like you're very much aware of it too, and I think there's an underlying, honestly, a bit of misogyny in there too, when like another, great actress is added to a franchise and be like, yeah. wait, we've got that one already. Right, like, yeah. Well, you can have a few. <laughs> you can, there's space. There's exactly, uh, totally, and I think with all the women in this, we have Pom Klementiev, yeah. in, incredible powerhouse, Vanessa Kirby, this kind of goddess, uh, and Rebecca, obviously. Um, they're also, we're also distinctive. Yes. And I also felt that none of us are objectified. We're not walking around in slinky dresses with flirtation being our number one currency. Right. You know, when Grace flirts, she flirts twice, once with Ethan, and then you see her flirting with a guy on a plane. It's all tactical. And you, it's part of her ammunition, but it's not the thing that ultimately it gives her the, you know, the currency that she uses. It's just something in her toolkit. And it means that you can find characters that have nuance rather than being one thing. Right. She's not the femme fatale, the ice, you know, she's the ice queen. She's not the ingenue. It means that she's, there is space because the writing is so clever and the structure is so good that you, you can have a character that's kind of in, consistently inconsistent and shows lots of different versions, which you go, oh, you mean she's human? Right. Oh, yeah, that's what we call humans, right? Because oh, like, we're a little oh, like, complex. Yeah, we're a little, we're a little contradictory. Right. We have many, many good qualities and bad qualities. Yeah. And yeah. So the history of this, I, from what I read, is it true that you actually met with McHugh and Tom for a Reacher movie as well? Or is that? Yeah, not? Okay. yeah. I think it was the first time I read for both of them, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that, I mean, you kind of alluded to this before, like the circuitous nature of a career you know, you can trust in that some of those those things are going to bear fruit down the line, and this certainly is an example of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you remember of that initial meeting? Was it a blow when that didn't come to pass, or were you inured to that as an actor, just like, okay, you know, it's I, I, of... I got my meeting with Tom Cruise and McHugh, oh, and it was yeah. great. Well, and it might sound sort of kind of Pollyanna of me to say it, but I think that the experience of working, doing that read-through with them, um, I kind of came away going, I feel like I've been in a masterclass, I don't feel like I've been in an audition, because they are... So um, they're so sort of explicit about their process and what they're looking for and what they want to try and what the camera's doing and let's just change the lighting here. If we, if we lit, light her from this direction, then she actually looks like she's withholding more information or she looks more mysterious or she looks totally open and therefore we feel for her more. So they're always, 
the conversation is that rather than ever making you as an actor self-conscious. Right. And, um, and they're gentlemen. They come in, Tom is always prepared. He's doing lines off camera that he's learned, but he is giving you as much as if it was his close up. And you go, oh, you, he's so present that you, you want to right. up your game too. Not, a, not in any way a competitive way, but in a sense of, you know, it's fun when you kind of like find someone that kind of wakes you up a little bit. Oh, so, yeah. and, I, and I felt like in retrospect, it was, you know, by that point, I'd been so used to rejection. <laughs> well, you're an actor, so yeah. unfortunately, I mean, unless you're Tom Cruise. Yeah, exactly. Unless you just make the film yourself. Um, yeah. That, that I had a kind of a healthy detachment from it. Right. Like you go in prepared. And the job is to go in and do the audition. What comes after that is shouldn't really be on your radar. And right. I would always be able to leave an audition and then I would go off and I would do something completely unrelated so that hopefully I wasn't just you know, thinking too much about, did I get it? Will I get it? Because that can kind of also rob you of your time. Sure. Um, so yeah, by then I felt like, I felt pretty pretty grounded in the experience. So you have, according to McHugh, roughly 40% of the next film has been shot. Do you have more of a handle on what the next film is than you had on the first one? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Embrace the chaos. It's okay, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you're in good hands. Yeah, totally. Okay. And I think also what they're doing is they're wanting to see the audience reaction to it. It's this all for the audience. So it's like this like, test like, screening process in real life. It's basically... Yeah, in real time. Like, yeah. are you not entertained? That's <laughs> what they often say you? to what each else other. You need? In a bigger cliff? What do you want? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you... And the, I was... I had dinner with Tom last night and he was just like... Eight is phenomenal. He's like, it's going to be, oh my God. It's go and you believe it and I believe it. And he's he both what they've already shot is so emotional. And it, it, you, it's, it's, this one really sets up what will happen next. That's, that's what I'm gauging. I can't tell you plot lines, no, get, yeah. which is great. I mean, it means that I can't, Plausible there's no, there's no you spoils. Can't literally, yeah. like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but can Grace possibly go on the journey? I mean, she, from the beginning of this film to the end, without spoiling anything, this is kind of the biggest arc in this film is for Grace. Mm, mm, yeah. Um, that would be probably tough to replicate on this, the next one, but again. Yeah, well, it's a very, for her, it's an origin story, right. this first one. Yeah. And she, the, the, sh the shift she makes of her own value system in this um, by, you know, towards the end uh, is, is huge, which is so great. But then, the next thing is going, well, how do I make sure that she doesn't plateau there now and just right. stay there? What 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 becomes her next skill set or how does she develop? And that's kind of, that will be up to me, but that will also be up to us discussing it going, let, you know, now that sh she's in, we don't right. want to be like, oh, now she's in and she right. she does this. It's It's got to feel that it has, again, this kind of forward momentum for her. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Guys, I'm so thrilled that BetterHelp is a sponsor of Happy, Sad, Confused because the stigma around therapy, thankfully, I feel like is behind us. And that is so excellent because therapy has helped me in the past. It has helped so many friends and family going through real life, real life stuff. We all deal with it. No matter how glossy it all looks on social media, we deal with those real things that come up in life whether it's the loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, all the day-to-day -day stuff that sometimes feels too much to bear. So whether you're dealing with decisions around career or relationships or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life so you can actually move forward with confidence and excitement. You can trust yourself to make decisions that align with your values. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. Trust me, guys. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's totally designed to be convenient, to be flexible, to suit your schedule. We're all so busy. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. If you've benefited from therapy in the past, you know what I'm talking about. If you have never tried therapy, BetterHelp can help you. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash HSC today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash HSC. Let me describe a situation that's probably familiar to all of you. You're looking for the right doctor, so you ask your friends, your family, you go on social media, you look around and you think you found the right one. They sound perfect, they're even close by you, it's not a trek. So you call the receptionist, you make the appointment, and right before you lock it in, you realize they don't take your insurance. 
I know guys, we've all been there, but wipe those tears away, put away the ice cream and head over to the doc to find and book the doctor who is right for you and yes, takes your insurance. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance, are located near you, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. These doctors have verified reviews from actual, real patients, not bots. The average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is just between 24 and 48 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. So, go to ZocDoc.com slash happy sad and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. It's striking to me because, you know, we talked in the past, of course, about the famous screen test for Captain America, which was, again, like one of these kind of old school, full on, you know, hair, makeup, the whole nine yards. Are those are these basically the only two you've done that in that way? Because most actors never have screen tests of, uh, of the yeah. that you've had. There's been a couple of also stu- big studio films that that have been the case, yeah. um, but never to this kind of level. I mean, the. With Captain America, it was it was at a studio, hair and makeup, lighting. There was a set, there was props. Right. Everything had been created to kind of look like she was in this office, and and that's that gives me so much more as an as an actor rather than just sitting on a chair reading lines. Right. You know, you're you're the the environment is doing so much for your own imagination. But with then with this screen test, there was the added physical test with Wade Eastwood, and he's this incredible stunt coordinator who's also a professional race car driver. He sprinted for South Africa. He is f- full on energy alpha male. It's amazing to be around him because you're like, oh, you gotta sit up straight. And he's, he's incredible at what he, as a teacher. And he would come in and he goes, I've got two hours to observe your natural ab- abilities, your physical fitness, your level of coordination. And I will then work out what to say to Tom McHugh is where we think we could get you to within five months of training. Because then that will often, there's no point in asking me to do high kicks or ninja right. moves or something that's required decades of training sure so we'd go through that and then based on what his observations he was like okay tom's gonna tom and McHugh are gonna be coming around the corner in about 20 minutes and i want the first thing that they see of your movement to be the most complicated stunt routine i can teach you so now i'm gonna give you now i've seen how you move i'm gonna create a stunt fight for you with another stunt guy and I'm gonna, once you practice it a few times, I'm gonna give you the nod when I can see that they're behind you and they're walking in. And I'll give you that cue to then do the most like complicated part of that routine. So I was like, okay. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Right off the, right off the no top, pressure. you sure? Okay. Yeah. And I was going, this is intense, but this is what mission will be like. Right. So if I can lean into that intensity and be sort of the eye of the storm with and calm down my own nervous system, then I know that I've got a chance to actually enjoy the experience of that. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I did it on cue. It was like, did it, did it. And then I, I, t- I punched the guy in the face, knocked him out. And then I turned around. And I was like, oh, hi, guys. Didn't see you there. How are you doing? <laughs> just hanging out with Wade Eastwood here, just uh, practicing a few moves. <laughs> and, and they were, and then they would scuttle off with Wade. And Wade would then talk them through about what this, how the screen test had gone for them. And it took me, you know, a long time to find out that they had... They tested with other, some other people who were first and foremost extraordinary athletes, sure. more than actors, and the, you know there's no comparison with what they were able to do compared to me. Um, but my fear, my feeling was like it's so great that they've been able to, they've cast someone who's first and foremost an actor yes. that can put performance into style, but also that they clearly were looking for um, someone who wasn't. Uh, slick and cool looking and but someone who was just you were going to feel for her when she's doing these stunts where you go she's she's competent she's she's got natural ability and skill but I don't know if she's going to make this <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes it exciting yes, there you go yes. I'll have you know by the way for the podcast generally we don't talk this much uh, usually about the current project but because I'm obsessed with it, and there's so much to talk about. That speaks well of the movie. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and one one thing we you know we've talked a little bit about Tom, but like 
there's so much endless fascination with him. And I look, mm-hmm. I've had great experiences with him, like opportunities like hosting that carpet and I hosted the Top Gun carpet and like to feel that energy and that presence that he has mm-hmm. that makes you feel like it's like they always talk about presidents that way, right? Makes you feel yeah. like you are the most important person in yes. the room when you're with him. I'm curious, like, is he like a familiar almost vibe to you? And this is this is my armchair uh, psychiatrist, like knowing like yeah. the, your background as I do, and your dad is right here, so we can always bring him in. <laughs> but like, I know your mom like was or is like a motivational speaker. Yeah. I feel like Tom yeah. could have been that. Like he's oh, the most yeah. positive human being that set, could set his mind to anything and inspire anyone to do anything. Yeah, and I, my, my experience, lived experience being on the receiving end of that for four years is it's not, um, it's not a sort of a, what they, the buzzword that I hear at the moment about toxic positivity or right, like right. blind, like you can do anything and you're like, well, probably not and being an astronaut though. Like it, he's right. not- Within- you, you, Within reason. Yes. Yeah, so, and you don't feel like he's also doing it to flatter you to, it's not it doesn't feel manipulative yeah. it feels like a genuine sense of his own humanity i think he he's a natural extrovert he really likes people and he gets energy from connecting with them i'm not i'm more of an extroverted introvert i yeah. I, I love it, and then I run out of steam, and I have to be alone for a long time. I relate. Yep. So you know, but he's he lives sort of outside of his own. He's he's not one for self reflection or self analysis. He kind of lives outside of his own kind of head. Right. Um, and that's why I think he's so engaged in the world and is able to safely do such complicated stunts because you have to be so spatially aware of what's happening because your life is on the line. And his love of movies has always ultimately driven him so it seems like you know the noise or the people's fascination with him he, he allows that sure. you know he understands it. he res- he respects it and he's i think very grateful to when you know fans particularly want to engage with him he's he's there for it and i remember when we were filming the Ro- rome car chase sequence on the imperiali and there was loads of fans either side and in between takes he would go up and he would you know at a distance with because of covid he'd be waving and you know taking pictures with them and you go, oh, he, he really loves this. Oh, yeah. He loves it. At this point, I, I've resorted to desperation and sadness in, in trying to get the coconut cake. I, I now solicit <laughs> everybody. Oh I, had a, God, I, I talked so... to Emily Blunt on the podcast yesterday. I think I spent half of our time talking about the cake. <laughs> I'm not going to do it to you, too. But just put a good word in. Haley. I just, really will. You should be on that list. I've never asked him directly. Emily says I should just say it to him, say I need it and want it, and he'll make yes. it happen. But I'm not that guy. So I'm now just like trying to manifest around. Indirectly. Right. I like it. I like your style. I it's will put sad. in a word for no, you. No, you don't have to. But I just, I just need to say it out loud. Um, so five years ago, we, we spoke on the podcast. And I don't know if you knew or had a sense at that time that... Peggy would be back in any incar- incarnation at that time. Mm-hmm. But you've you've popped up in some interesting, fun places. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, talk, let's, let's talk first about, um, I know you talked to death about it, but indulge me if you would, the, the end of Endgame. When did you mm-hmm. find out that that was going to be how oh, that film gosh, actually ended? That's a really good question. I, I, can't, I, can't, I re- genuinely can't remember, because yeah. it was also two days of filming. Uh, or maybe was it like a day and a half? And it was so secretive that I I just kind of went and did it, left, didn't tell anyone, and went back to, I think I was maybe doing a play or something at mm-hmm. the time. But um, when they told me, I knew, it's like, it's such a, what an amazing moment to end everything for that sweetness for them to get that dance and the song that they chose. And when they told me there'll be this like long shot of the house and the door would already be opened and there'll be a, they, they, they said at first they didn't want, I think that's really smart of them to do, um, they didn't want him knocking on her door and her answering it and her reaction. Because that seems to be an obvious but very literal. Mm. But there's something for me when I watch it now more evocative by the fact that you just see the door open, the song's already playing. It's like that they had that initial moment at the door just for themselves. Right. Wow. And it's and so how that then lives in the audience's imagination is they get to fill in the emotion of that for themselves rather than seeing Peggy have that emotion. And then you go in and they're already they've already found each other. And it feels like you're just it's a voyeuristic kind of discovery of them both together, which I thought was so sensitively done. Yeah. It must have been very satisfying for you to see how that film and that moment was received because that film is, there's so much in it and it's the end of a saga and there's so much bombast and, and big set pieces and yet it ends on this quiet, emotional moment that 
is yours and, yeah. and, and the wholesome, person's, yeah. bittersweet. Yeah, they, I think they've, you know, they did a, such a fantastic job with that of just because it's so impactful. It's just a moment. Yeah. But it's, you know, after all of that, it's almost like the epilogue that roots us back down to, you know, reality and just two human beings without superhero yeah. uh, capes. Um, just having a dance. Just having a dance. Having um, a dance. But you did get to don the shield since we've last <laughs> spoken. <laughs> I've spoken to all, all a bunch of folks that have participated in this in the in the scene in Multiverse of Madness. Uh, was he Olsen? I took the Daniel Craig who almost was there. Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> so what is your recollection? Because like, was everybody there when you shot your stuff? No. Um, John, uh, John Krasinski wasn't there. <laughs> Um, Lashana Lynch was there. Patrick Stewart wasn't there. Um, so it was weird. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, and, like, and you sure this is actually happening. Yeah. Other people are going to be in the shot too, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, but, but that's sort of the nature, I think of something of a scale of that big that, you know, just CGI is going to sort everything yes. out. And it's very much the, it's the direct, it's felt that felt very much the director and the editor's medium as opposed to the actor's medium. Cause you sure. know, you're at one point there was this Patrick Stewart when he comes in there was a guy that came in and they, he, it was like he was on some sort of little contraption that had a cardboard yellow kind of cutout around it. And it, when he arrived, I remember on action, it was all very earnest and very intense. And then, but there was this, there's a slight delay of his entrance and we just heard the <laughs> and then how he sort of has to turn in. <laughs> And that's it. And I mean, there were a couple of times the shot our shoulders were, were, were going because it's such, you know, to be that earnest and then be undermined by this me. <laughs> it's like the equivalent of a fart cushion. Like totally, that, yeah. completely. It's exactly that. <laughs> and, like, and then having to be like, mm, he, the great man himself. Mm. And, it, you know, so it, it was, it was, it felt, but it also reminded me of drama school. You know, I've been like sure. the color blue and the, a, a weeping willow tree. You just, you, not many things embarrass me anymore. Right. Which is great. <laughs> so did you even know which characters were going to end up in that finished scene? Like, I didn't. I think that they were, you know, we did lots of different things, lots right. of different takes, and then they kind of, the way that they edited it, it was like, oh, f- suddenly just out of, just very quick. And I think they're kind of, you know, watching her, I get a lot of so much slack. I'm like, it's not, wasn't my choice when they're like, you know, she's like, I could do this all day. And then followed by, she's immediately cut in half by a Frisbee. And and then the audience being like, she can't do it all day. Uh, apparently, apparently not. Apparently you can't. So yeah, egg on your face. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't really serve Peggy very well. Did you uh, did you practice that line in the mirrors? That's the equivalent of like Bond, James Bond for you. You have, that's the moment. That's the line I, you want to nail. I didn't give it a th- second thought because... I didn't want to give myself too much pressure because right. if I'd practiced it, it's a bit like if you repeat a word over and over again, it loses right. all meaning. Right. So it'd be like, you know, I, I would have probably come in that day and been like, I could do this all day. <laughs> I would have been, it would have been like the weight of it. Would right. be like, okay, it would have been too much. So I, I had, and I also thought it's more of a throwaway line because in Peggy's mind, she's not going, I'm going to say the big Captain America line. <laughs> she's as Peggy. Remember from the movie? Yeah, turn yeah. to the camera. <laughs> exactly. In Peggy's reality, she's just like loving being in there in the moment. Right. She's like, I'm built for this. Yes. So I had to kind of make sure that I was doing it in a way that just felt like a throwaway line. Is it out of your system now? Do you feel like you got your money's worth from... I felt like... I had much more to do in the What If animation series, which was, I mean, any actor will tell you, to be able to go into a booth in effectively your pajamas right. and, <laughs> and do an animation is great fun because you're just, you're focused on the, the voice as the instrument and as your main sort of performative tool. Um, and I love that in that, they've been able to give her just more to do as, as Captain Carter, Captain Britain. Um, so it, it felt like a frustrating moment in Strange, because you're like, uh, uh, here we go, this is it? Is it? <laughs> no, we oh. don't. <laughs> <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. She had less to do than what she did before, before she had the shield. Um, <laughs> but I love, but what was really great was the, you know, coming in and doing even those stunt things, you know, when she does that kind of very quick run, but then sliding on my knees and like going over backwards. And I had come straight off the first time I was wrapped for Mission 7, because I was wrapped uh, nine, nine <laughs> times. times yeah. yeah, and so I went straight from the set of Mission to the airport to LA, uh, wearing a, then put the, put the outfit on, did one costume fitting, and then straight in. And they were like, hey, this is the fight. And because I had been so 
like maintaining that level of physicality right. i was able to just go like i want to do it all let me let me have a go at this and signing on my knees was just great fun it seems cruel then you're ready you've got all the skills we've let's not like nip this in the bud too early i know, I know. and yeah. they're like no no yeah. Uh, are you going to see Rogers the Musical? You know this actually now exists. What? It, it, they, they are performing it at Disneyland now. The, like the, a, oh, the wait, the, like, like the, the, musical, the, the version the, they did in Hawkeye. They built yeah. it out a bit, and you oh, can wow. watch like a forty-five minute version oh. of Rogers the Musical. Oh. <laughs> Does that That's make you happy so or sweet. sad or confused or? Um, I mean, look, give the people <laughs> give the people what they want. <laughs> right. That's my thoughts on that. <laughs> There is nothing I hate more than wasting money. That's why I'm so thrilled about our sponsor this week on Happy Sad Confused. It's Rocket Money. How often have you bought into that try it free for 30 days guarantee, right? That's just enough time to try it. And then, of course, you completely forget about it. It's happened to me. It's happened to you. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forget about. Rocket Money is there for you. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you. And for any you don't want to pay for anymore, you just hit cancel. And Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. It also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses. So you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person, get this, up to $720 a year. So stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash HSC. That's rocketmoney.com slash HSC. Rocketmoney.com slash HSC. Speaking of theater... You were a creature of the theater. It's been a, it's been a minute, I think. Was it right yeah. before the pandemic that you basically were on the stage, or it was right before I got mission. So 2019, yeah. I did Rosmer's Home, uh, a, a play that Ibsen is the second most performed playwright in the world. This is a play hasn't usually been performed by, which is bizarre because it's so brilliant. But also, it's probably because no one can pronounce it. So I remember there was a couple of times on stage where I have to go, I have to say like, oh yes. The, the ghost of Rosmer's home, and sometimes they're like, the ghost is Rosmer's <laughs> so, Sorry? Rumble bum. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, maybe that's why it's not performed much, guys, because right. no one can pronounce it. But um, I had done that, and, uh, and also the adaptation, this guy, Duncan McMillan, who did Lungs and People, Places and Things, this brilliant playwright, he had basically taken the original text and wiped off all the dust taken away all the bum rolls and taken away that sort of thing that exists in those kind of those kind of melodramas where it just feels like everything's made of brown carpet you <laughs> yeah, know yep. and like that like kind of mel melancholic kind of laborious you know everyone's dying of some sort of ancient disease right. and so he just kind of r refreshed all of that and it was it was amazing so then to be able to I think it was like a month later I was doing a screen test for mission I was just going what is my life what am I doing? Have you been seeing any theater other than London or here? I did. Up? I saw Motive in the Queue the other day. I don't know about that. That's at that the at National. The West... okay. Yeah. It's getting a West End. It's just finished, but it's getting a West End run, I think, in December. It's Mark Gatiss and Johnny Flynn. And they play John Gielgud and Richard Burton. And the play is about the very famous production that Gielgud directed Burton in of Hamlet that went on to be an absolute box office sensation. But the making of it was just fraught with two men who have equal amount of insecurities right. about different things and how the tension between them as two heavyweights of right. the acting of the theater and the Hollywood world. Um, and it's, it's, it's so well done. And it's directed by Sam Mendes. Oh, okay. I mean, Sounds pretty good. Yeah. Have you ever done stage work here? In New York? I haven't. That's a bit surprising, no? I, mean, I agree. I mean, like, you've, come there, on, guys. I, mean, I think there's been an opportunity or two. You're just a busy lady. There were, no, I don't think, I think it would be more of coming here and spending time here so that I was more, you know, was able to take meetings and meet more playwrights because there's, there's, um, the, it's, it also means that, I mean, there was talk about Rosman's Home coming over to New York and I think, that would be something I would love to revisit because it was so it was such a great production, but it, it, it's it's very rare that those British productions get brought over because it's right. a whole kind of 
business. Is there, do you find yourself generally more inspired by roles you see on stage or on screen, or is it just like a good, a good performance is a good performance that, can, that you can sink your teeth into? A good performance is a good performance. I think that when I was doing Mission, um, McHugh has this incredible list, you might know about it, which is all the films that he loves and knows. And he, it was one of the first things he did when we, I got the job, is like, just to let you know for reference, these are all the films that inspire me. And if you want to know about, uh, you know, look at, you know, look at What's Up Doc, look at, right. you know, heist movies, look at The Train, look at Shane, mm -hmm. um, Battles Are Galactica, look, all his favorite Ooh, films. Now you're speaking my language, okay. Yeah, like all this stuff, <laughs> Galaxy Quest, is it like all this, like, it. Oh my so God. it's a real, real variety yeah. of things. And I, and I, and Ordinary People is in there, <laughs> which is a, one of Tom's favorite films. And there's something about those older movies that feel so beautifully naturally written. Like right. I love the 70s heist movies and I also love the more domestic um, family dramas of like ordinary people. Yeah, Kramer like versus Kramer. Kramer versus yeah. Kramer, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And um, and then also the justice films like, you know, you know, Dog Day Afternoon and All the President's Men and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. The, all the Cinema uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Serpico, all that great exactly. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. And they feel to me I get, I, I'm probably like most people watching would maybe relate to this, that there is a, such a, di there's such an overwhelm of content now of new yeah. things coming out and films going to streamers or uh, the, the cinematic experiences tend to, until now, thanks to <laughs> Mr. Cruz. We're bringing it back. Saving Hollywood. <laughs> but there is that, it's really hard for me to know what to watch now. Yeah. And so often I'll go back to those the, that the kind of a golden a different kind of golden age um but with with theater i think when i was a kid i just i don't think i was aware of it at the time but i think i would just be seeing much more um better written characters for women and i wouldn't necessarily think it was a gender thing for me uh, it was before i was sort of aware of any of that right. but i would just you know watching people like fiona shaw or juliet stevenson or judy dench and on that stage with with such command of their physicality and their voices um and there were complex women too. Um, and they, a lot of them at the time weren't trying to be likable. There was something inherently likable in how relatable they were. Um, that to me, I think was the thing that always kind of maybe sit forward and go, God, how do you, how do you do that? How, where, where I want to, I want to learn how to do that. I think there is that tendency now because like every movie needs to deliver. And there, there's not a tendency that I feel like there's a sense that no film can fail now. Right. Yeah. And so you have to paint in very broad strokes because you don't want to risk nuance with an audience. And we were talking about the complexity of even like a character like Grace or all the, the characters in Mission. Like there are shades of gray and, and, and contradictions, which is great and rare in a blockbuster. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's, I think, why we don't see kind of those great dramas that are all about complexity and shades of gray because, oh no, the audience needs like very obvious archetypes now. Yes, or, or like the, our concentration seems to, we, we, we are faster now than we ever were. Right. So it's this sense of, um, don't take too much time, like get onto the next thing to kind of keep your, keep your concentration so you don't flick over to another channel yep. or start scrolling through, through your phone. But I think when you have a film that really trusts what it is and can be brave and how, how long it's going to take to, like I felt that with, was it The Power of the Dog? Yeah. It was, it, it held my attention, but it was un, an unhurried film. Yes. And that's because the writing was so good, the performances. There's you know. nothing I love more than feeling like I'm in the deliberate, confident hands of a filmmaker that like yeah. can take their time and knows where to put the camera and just, I can just sit back and like not do any work. I'm gonna let them yes. take me on a ride. Yes. And that can be Jane Campion or it could be McHugh, it could be as long as they know what they're doing. Yes, regardless of what the genre is. If it's if yeah. it's fulfilling the um, the requirements of that kind of structure of storytelling, then you you can, it can be a franchise or it can be a, right. a fantasy or it can be a family drama and it engages you. Um, random question for you uh, are you caught up on succession i am are you happy that your buddy matthew despicable matthew mcfadden on the show <sighs> rose to the top i'm it's it's what he deserves <laughs> <laughs> he is truly one of the greatest scene partners you could ever have i'm luck, lucky to work with him three times and the you know that delicious feeling when you're at school and you're not allowed to laugh Right. And you, it's the most one, like it's the best feeling ever when your friend like cracks a joke in class and everyone is silent and you're, you just lose it. It's one of my favorite feelings to have, like laughing, giggling uncontrollably when it's inappropriate. And I would have that a lot with Matthew. Um, he has this like, he's just so, he, he's a virtuoso. He can kind of like the musicality of what he does. Sounds kind of like a bit you know, wistful to say that, but 
he's just so ta deeply talented yeah. and fun. He's funny. We, you know, on Howard's End, we'd prank each other a lot. I kind of kept it going. I, I remember you talking about uh, your love of pranks. I would imagine on a mission set, that's probably not the best thing to do. You don't want to like pull a prank when a guy is like jumping off a cliff on a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> no. No parachute. Ah. And not in, not in COVID either. They're like, no. it's... You're like, oh, no, this is not the time <laughs> or the place. Although for Halloween, I did, I took one of the masks from the makeup trailer and I uh, decked out Simon Pegg's trailer in um, cobwebs and hanging skeletons and hid in the corner with a, the mask on and jumped out at him. That, I got my fix. Right. Yeah. He can take it. Yeah. Um, so okay, we talked a little bit about all the franchise work. Are you good on franchises now? If Fast and Furious, if Harry Potter, if they come calling... Is there interest? Um, Anything that, that you have not, an uh, itch that has not been scratched in the genre world of, of film? Well, I've done, um, I've been doing the voiceover for the animation of the new Lara Croft oh, for yes. Netflix, yeah. which is really fun. Also partly because all I have to do is go in in my pajamas and grunt a lot. And on screen, <laughs> she's like jumping off a cliff or you know, getting away from a zombie. And, and I'm like, having a whale of a time because I'm just like sipping <laughs> on my green tea. the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> yeah. But I, I really enjoyed that. I think, yeah, it's 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 less about, um, again, it's going, what is the, it, it's, it, it entertains me and delights me to no end when they hire an actor who, who comes in and has can have a go at progressing the genre a little bit yeah. by offering nuance or being offering a fresh perspective of going, you know, you can have a heroine that's not badass. You can have right. a heroine that is at times, but then also full of self-doubt right. and not, um, yeah, just being going, you know, we can, we could do lots of different things and to your delight, it's not just to make a point, but this can exist for you to the benefit of the audience. Yeah, this is the danger, right? It's like, cause we have this conversation for many years. It's like, and, and rightfully so, you know, actresses talking about wanting to play strong characters and that's great, yeah. but, but a lot of us are weak too at, at times. We, yeah. you, it's okay to show that complexity too. Yeah. It's all, again, it's showing all the colors. Yes, and I remember uh, there was an interview Emily Blunt did when she was promoting the English, which I just loved. Oh yeah, beautiful. And she said something like, you know, that she gets that question a lot of like, oh, you know, do you, what attracts you to strong characters? And she was like, it, it, it's nuance we want, yeah. not, not one thing, because you're just then, putting in one word to, to you know, in place of what went before, like fem the sexy one or the damsel right. one. It's like, well, it's just, you're, you're saying one thing. Yes. Yeah, and no one is that. Uh, dub smash, Haley Atwell is dead, but long live TikTok, Haley Atwell, she's coming. Just getting my bearings. Feeling the buzz, we're feel <gasps> it's in the air, everyone's feeling it. You can feel I'm like, <laughs> the I'm dancers gearing up are about to come I'm like, out. yeah. I feel like a bit of a, like a, on a racetrack and the, the gates are about to open because right. like, I'm just t tipping my water going, is that how you do it? Is that good? Is that what you want? And then I think right. I'm kind of, I'm like, I'm getting, I'm getting a bit of a taste for it. <laughs> Who knows what I'm going to end up doing on that. Are you, are you studying the platform? Are you, you know, seeing what the algorithms tell you to do? Or are you trying to figure out the right dances? What's, what's the prep like to unleash the inner <sighs> maniac Haley Atwell on the world? Oh, well, it's like a... I see, I mean, I'm so in awe of the people who do it well, those accounts where it's an amazing edit and a dance and a twist, and it's right. so funny. It's the ones that are really funny and edited in a way, particularly that involve, for me, that involve animals, um, <laughs> which I, I'm like, I can't compete with an, an, a bounding Alsatian falling over a bucket. I can't. Don't sell yourself short, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's end with this. The happy, sad, confused, profoundly random questionnaire. Some random questions as if these haven't been so random for you. Uh, do you collect anything? Oh, good question. Um, do I? Well, Dad here. Dad remembers when I collected trolls. Oh, the, do the dolls, me, not the dolls. actual. Okay, yeah. Yes. <laughs> the mythical creatures. Uh, yes, or the trolling of social media. Right. I definitely don't collect them. I block them. Um, Is the collection still intact? The collection still intact. The hairs are brushed. I didn't cut them. I didn't dismember them. They're all there. They're all just like happy to be there. In fact, Dad, you don't know this, but I, when I was in Svalbard, um, they, uh, the original troll, the designer, oh. uh, they had a beautiful selection. And I've bought one for you, Dad. Yeah. There is one that I'm, I brought back from the Arc, all the way from the Arctic. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we are keeping that collection alive. Now, is the original collection, like, is the childhood Haley bedroom filled still, like, is it, it preserved with the trolls, like, as it was when you were 14 years old? Like, is there a shrine? Gosh, that would be really creepy. 
like it's not unprecedented some people have that <laughs> for me they're uh, tucked away in the basement like okay. a dirty secret okay uh what's the wallpaper on your phone Oh, uh, oh, it kind of, um, it switches, you know, sometimes I get, I, I'm kind of clumsy with my fingers and it kind of sets, right. you know, but anyway, it's my fiance with my two dogs who are sort of like climbing all over his face. And then the other one is Venice because it was, you know, it's so amazing to film there. So, and it was like, it's such a poetic haunting place that, yeah, it's got great, a special place in my heart. Film, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, last actor you were mistaken for? Have you ever signed an autograph of a photo of someone else? Just like, okay, fine, I'll sign it. It's Yes, uh, Felicity Jones. Sure. Yeah, when I was doing uh, A View from the Bridge at the Duke of York's Theatre, guy really you know, effusively came up to me. He's like, can I have your autograph? I was like, sure. And I looked down and I was like, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, can you sign it anyway? I'm like, no, I'm not defacing Felicity's face. It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the worst note a director has ever given you? Um... Oh, that's a good question. What? <laughs> I'm going to out someone now. And no, um, respectfully speaking, I remember doing a play with a very established older director. And I had, they, we were t working out staging and we couldn't kind of work out what the best way of staging this bit was. So I just said, oh, um, maybe should I go downstage when this person goes across? And he was like, no, 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 no. I was like, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then the other actor, much older, said, uh, well, why don't Haley come downstage and I'll go across? Hadn't heard me. And, they, and the director went, oh yeah, that's brilliant. And then I said, and, it, and I just was like, it'd been a long time of a lot of this. So I was like, can I just say, <laughs> I've, I've just said that. <laughs> and he, he said, I'm sorry, what can I say? You're an actress underneath, under the age of 30. Why would I listen to anything you'd have to say? He sort of made, poked fun at how, um, he said the quiet part out loud. He said, he said the quiet part out loud to be like, you know, I know I'm self-aware enough to know I'm it, a, being it, a I dick. I absolve myself of being an yes. asshole. Yes, I'm like, no, <laughs> no, you just, no, you don't. Um, but, you know, and, and so uh, that could have taught me, it was a really t good turning point in my career though, because I thought if I give a director or anyone too much authority over my own performance, and then if that director is not empowering me or not encouraging me right. or, or using kind of positive notes that are active, then I, I'm, it will have to, I, it was my responsibility to self-direct. And so that was a, you know, I, with, with you know, respect to him now, I, you know, I'm like, well, actually that made me in a way, that made me go, okay, I'm gonna have to make myself more visible then. Sadly, if that's the culture and the climate, right. then I'm not, it's either I, I buckle from that and I go away going, I'm not enough, or I go, oh, is that what we're dealing with? Okay, I need to step up then. Um, so it was, you know, it was actually kind of, I used it to my, you know, turned it to my favor. Uh, if you were to host a podcast, what would the subject matter be? What are you an um, expert in? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the closest we've come to the return of uh, the Tiffany voice, which you unveiled five years ago. Yes. That was your American, which I miss. Oh my God, yes. She is. I love the, it's the, what is that? The fry, vocal right. fry. <laughs> I love her. Because uh, right, it's also, it's such a high status voice. It's like, I am so wealthy that I don't have to make any effort because like even speaking, making any effort is exhausting. And it's I, like, it's such a power play, I love it. Um, podcast wise. all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get this on it. <laughs> um, podcast, Podcast. Yes. Um, oh, oh, that's a really good one. That's a, oh God, I can't come up with anything. That's okay. You Good. Can... I would say that it was would be to do with. I'd love to sort of interview people, creative minds across the fields of yeah. like you know and of of culture and stuff. But maybe the through way in is something to do with their dog, because I, I love dogs. Okay, so we'll, we'll we talk about dogs off camera because okay. uh, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, in honor of Happy Sad Confused, actor that always makes you happy, Matthew McFadden. A uh, movie that makes you sad, <sighs> E.T. Mm. The last 10 minutes of E.T. Brilliance. Mm. No, like almost no words. That's, yeah. Okay. And finally, food that makes you confused. Oh, um, mango and cream. <laughs> <laughs> 
is it so prevalent that we need to worry about it as a thing? I didn't yeah, know mango and cream was a thing. It's it, well, it's it's if mango is put into a smoothie that has yogurt in it. Yep. Uh, or like the, we had this ice lolly in the UK called the Solero, which was okay. ice cream in the middle and mango around the outside. Okay. I just couldn't. I can't get. I can't get on board with it. Um, You're I okay love with the mango. elements, mango and cream, Lo- but that's together. I love mango. It doesn't need to be faffed around to make it something it's not. It's not a creamy thing. It's a citrus, fruity, right. tropical number. Um, leave it alone. Hell yeah. Well, taking a stand, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Um, you're amazing in this movie. You're amazing that you are uh, way more coherent than I am after traveling the world for the last <laughs> few weeks. Uh, hopefully you'll take a little bit of a break soon. Um, again, for the audience out there, it's as if it needs to be said, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, part one. Need all your breath for that one. Um, I'll see you hopefully for, for part two at some other far-flung location next year. Indeed. Um, and thanks as always. It's good oh to my see God. you. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. (laughs) 